I'm Keith Wiles, um, principal engineer at, uh, at Intel. I focus on DPDK, and we're going to try to understand what it means today. Uh, I also focus on network stacks and so forth. So I've been doing a few things within uh, Intel. Let's see if I can get this going here. So what we're really going to do is talk about what DPDK is. And I'm, it's really an IO acceleration engine that runs in user space on Linux. Okay, so it really drives traffic from a network device to user space and back again and various other places as well. So what we're trying to do here is in this particular case is look at how that's done. And I can't cover every detail, but we'll try to get into some of it. What we have is we have specialized DPDK uh, pull moon drivers that sit in uh, user space that access the network cards directly bypassing the Linux kernel. Okay, this software is all fully open sourced and all the source you can pull it down from dbdk.org. Uh, it's also a uh, BST license. It says MIT there. I thought that was fixed, but uh, it's an actual BSD license source software, so it's freely distributable. You can do anything you want with it. We don't care, but I think you'll find the performance is really good. It's all written in standard ANSI C, except for a few places that we write it to use uh, some assembler instructions uh, only to gain the best performance. We typically always have a backup for that assembly version. We have a C implementation of it. Not always, but in most cases, it, it, that's the way it's done. And my watch is going crazy here. So. <laughs> So what we're trying to do is, is, is accelerate the network and get you the best performance in crypto and network performance. So this slide here kind of is that kind of similar slide that Jim had, but it's really trying to point out to you that we have a lot of pieces and a lot of people involved in this. And I'm not going to try to go through all of this, but, and I'm going to go back through part of this, but there's a huge number of people involved in this world all want networking performance to be high. And we'll go over this slide here, this section here, and some of the performance numbers as well. So this is, DBDK is multi-architecture. It is not just Intel processors. It is also ARM processors and PowerPC processors. We ported it to multiple architecture platforms, and it runs on multiple Linux <coughs> environments. Typically, we run it in Ubuntu and various other places, but it runs in a lot of places. It also runs on FreeBSD. So we started out way back when here. We'll go across the top here. We started out back at 1.8. We bring in Power8, uh, PowerPC. We bring in TileX and 2.1. We bring in the ARM SOCs and ARM architectures, V7, V8, and 2.2. And then we changed numbering schemes. We went to a year-month uh, numbering scheme, and that's the way we're moving forward from, from now on. So 1604 was uh, obviously this year at, in, in April, and we also brought in uh, 1607 was just released. Now what really happened is the bigger pieces of work that happened down here, because DBDK is fairly easy to port to different hardware architectures. It's to get the other parts, which is the drivers right, which is more difficult. So as you can tell, obviously we had a lot of Intel processor uh, architecture NICs in here. And we get Cisco, and we get Mellanox, and Chelsea, and so forth. And you can see them all listed out here. And you can see it's starting to get really crowded under here at the bottom. So a lot of network uh, supported cards here, even, even the SOC implementations and so forth. So that's really been a big boon for us. It's really bringing the community together. Are there any questions about any of these pieces? I mean, we're moving towards 1611 uh, is our next release, and we'll have a lot of pieces in that as well. So as you can tell, there's a lot of new support and support coming in all the time. You said porting to a new platform was pretty easy, but that the driver element was hard. Who, who ends up writing the drivers? Does that get farmed out to the, the hardware guys? Uh, it's typically done by, uh, like at Intel, we do it our software guys write the drivers, or they port it from, uh, originally they started with the FreeBSD drivers, because they're freely available to us, because they already wrote them. We modified them slightly into pull mode drivers, and then brought them into DPDK. 
And other people have done similar things. Some people have implementations that run on both Linux kernel and in user space as a whole mode driver. But it's a mix. It's a mix. And then who's driving? You know, what platform you write to next? Is it a is it a vendor? Is it a user saying typically I it's really a want it's this? a vendor or user? It's a it's all contributed from the from the industry. Yeah. So like in in this particular case, uh, uh, Netronome or Broadcom would come in and say, I, I want that supported because it's not supported in your current PMD modes. So I'll bring it in and I'll, I'll supply that code. And most likely they'll maintain it. Not always. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. So it's completely open source. So really, DBDK, and you might hear that term a couple more times, <laughs> uh, really boils down to is it's a user space application to accelerate network, network I.O. to network devices. So we've made all of that part as, as efficient and as fast as possible. What happens in DBDK is we have a little environment when you, you start it up, and you, there's a bunch of examples. Uh, we grab the individual cores on a multi-core system. We isolate those cores so they aren't running Linux applications. Or, or taking interrupts or anything else. And we try to isolate those cores so that we can control what interrupts that core and making sure that we aren't wasting any cycles doing something else like a timer tick or something like that. Uh, so all of those cores, each one is a run to completion model, meaning that the application runs and finishes and then continues. So it's utilizing the net, that core at the fullest rate, meaning it's 100% it's utilized. Now there's a, another mechanism in here that you can turn on interrupts and go into what Linux calls more like a nappy mode, where you wake up from an interrupt, do some I.O. quickly, you find out you have no more I.O. to do, you kind of go back to sleep waiting for another interrupt. So you can then conserve your power or the core processing time. Now, one of the best ways that we get to those devices that are from Linux user space is through SROV, which is a PCIe uh, design or uh, standard. So we map these device registers into the application itself in user space, and the pull mode drivers, the PMDs, pull those devices as fast as they can. Pulling, we can't take interrupts. Interrupts take too long and you get stuck with interrupt cycle times, okay? So <clears throat> it's the pull mode driver here, and we also deal with it. There's a lot of applications that run in uh, DBDK, and it is a different mindset for some people for that application. But for people who need it, they know what they need to do. They need to get their piece done, and that this is the fastest way to get that processing completed. And this is kind of a picture of it, kind of a high-level picture, I guess. DPDK is a series of libraries and um, uh, uh, utilities within it. There's a huge number of utilities and libraries, and we'll see that in a minute. But there's lockless driver or lockless rings. There's uh, memory allocation. There's a, there's a specialized memory copy for Intel that uses AVX instructions to copy memory from one place to the other, which significantly speeds things up. Uh, if you need to copy, the whole point here is is we're not copying packets. We're just moving pointers around, but occasionally somebody needs to do some kind of copy. We bypass the Linux kernel completely. We actually steal the ports away from the Linux kernel. So he doesn't have control over them anymore. He may initialize them, but that's about it. <coughs> Typically, in our case, we reinitialize those devices anyway. Okay. So, just so I have a complete picture. So, <coughs> I write an application you know, multi-threaded application so I can do some parallel processing. Yep. I link against the DBDK, DB, I can't say this fast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> DPDK library, and I can tune how many cores are running this, or is it going to lay across all the cores on my system? Either way you want to do it. Okay. You can pick the cores, and you can randomly pick which cores you want within your system to use. Uh, you can pick uh, all of them if you like. Typically, most people leave like one core for Linux 
to do its processing so it doesn't get bogged down, right? Because once one of these threads start up, it's, it's consuming that core, right? So, and we don't want other things interrupting that core, so we, that's why we do the isolations. And do you see people having dedicated NIC cards added to the, the server in order to, I mean, if you're claiming the yep. ports, yep. somebody's losing their management network, right? No, no, chances are the management network is like a one gigabit port. Mm -hmm. So it's probably, it's, it's isolated over there. They'll still have it if they want it. Uh, typically, DBDK is stealing the 10 gigabit ports and the 40 and the 100 or whatever port there's over there, right? You can still do some traffic through those ports that have been stolen away to DPDK, but you have to add that functionality to get those packets back to the Linux kernel. Okay, and there's multiple ways to do that in DPDK today. Uh, I wouldn't call it a high performance path to get from there. Yeah, your packets will be arriving at, you know, wire rate at 10 gigabit or 20 gigabit, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And most people don't quite realize the Linux kernel is fairly slow at networking, but it's pretty quick if you're just surfing the web, but if you're trying to move data or move packets, it's, it's not, as, not as good. And that's why this is all created. Does that answer that one? Yeah, yeah okay. that answers. I'm curious, um, in, your, in, your, in your studies of performance statistics, have you found uh, that the bottleneck was more within the Linux kernel itself, or maybe just the fact that the packet processing wasn't being done in parallel, or was it a combination of both? Probably a combination of both. And also, the Linux kernel tended to want to a packet at a time mentality, right? Because that's the way the network stacks were built: is one packet at a time through the stack. Yeah. And then you have to transition from user space to kernel space and back again. And there's a whole bunch of things that happen there. So there's a lot of overhead just transferring. Yeah. Transferring. My point being, this isn't just one thing you've optimized. You've actually no, tackled opted a huge three number of pieces. pieces yeah. yeah. And we've taken it all to our set. Basically, we, we own all of that memory and all of that stuff. And then say, hey, now you can drive your traffic through there. We actually tried, tried many different angles. So, uh, like back to the gentleman's question earlier on, but make no mistake about it. This is, an, this is an overhaul of your network stack, right? So you have to rewrite your application to take advantage of this, which is, which is fine for if you want to build a router, a switch, or a firewall that needs that kind of performance, right? We're saying this is high performance networking. So 40 gig, you know, 10 gig, 40 gig, anticipating 100 gig NICs next year, multiple hundreds in the, you know, four or five years from now. That's the kind of stuff we're starting to architect for right now. But make no mistake about it, you migrate to this in order to take advantage of, you know, higher performance networking. So you need to overhaul your application. Now the reverse, what we tried is, okay, you take the existing Linux stack, and you're gonna go and plug those holes. And then you actually, typically it boils down to one massive problem, which is ultimately, I think it's memory allocation, to be, to be really honest. Right? If you say, if you, if you tell um, uh, Linux, give me a buffer, right? no, no matter what kind of buffer, right? whether it is a networking buffer or what else, if, if it's going to give you a buffer from somewhere in memory. Right? You, you don't know where it's going to come from. And then you say, subsequently, give me another buffer. And then Linux might say, well, I'm actually busy, I'm actually busy here. I'm busy processing some protocol data for you there. So you're not going to get that buffer just yet until that is deallocated. So right. typically you have those, those locking semantics that you deal with in Linux that are very expensive. And if you say if there is one big problem you deal with, with networking, it's typically right. that, that it's the big It's the big granular locks. And we've, by the way, we've removed all the locks. There is no locking here because we don't need it the way we've designed the system. And the Linux kernel has locks everywhere. It was made for that. I mean, it works really well as your desktop, but it doesn't work really well in a networking environment to do yeah, there, traffic. It's actually a good point, right? There is reasons for that. You, you want compatibility. You want, you know, if you're building, if you're, um, you know, if you're doing some, uh, you know, network, if you're doing some uh, web server, you terminate some traffic, right? You, you, and you want to, after that, handle, hand off that packet into another application. That, that's very well supported, right? That, that, that uh, what do they call it in Linux? You know, you have this whole, the, you know, the whole chain, you know, pack, packet processing chain, if you want to build that, IP chains, right? You can yeah, build IP that. Chains. Very well supported. And it's great because it's very easy for you to configure. But to make it fast, not so much. And there is, yeah. there's a reason for that, right? Because it's very flexible. So here is where we say, okay, let's toss some of that flexibility to the side. Let's go develop a new framework, DPDK, that allows you to, you know, 
pro, you need to re repro, re, you know, re rebuild your application. You can take a, a big portion of your application across into that standard C environment, but you do need to port your application to that new bottom layer, which is, which is give me a packet. Right? And then we yep. say, well, actually, we're going to give you 16 at a time because that's what we do really well. And then you process 16 at a time. And then when you're done, you can say, okay, and then give me the next 16. And then we've already queued them up in an area of memory. Instead of interrupting you, we're saying, hey, go pull for these packets because we're going to give them 16 in a bunch at this particular memory location. And it's a fixed memory location, so you don't need to say to Linux, give me a new buffer. And then Linux is going to do some memory allocation. It's going to put the buffer there. It's going to allocate the memory. It's going to copy start, the memory. Start, in start mapping start pages jumping. in and out. And we've turned all that stuff off. We figured out how to make it so that the memory is not paged out, and it's and we don't hit any TLB misses and things like that. So it's so a lot of things we've done here that make this very transparent. And one of the key points I wanted to make sure is that this isn't going in and taking your web server, which runs on sockets and making it run on top of DBDK without any modifications. You will have to go in and modify your application to make, take advantage of this performance, okay? Um, Excuse me? Yeah. Have you done some performance comparisons basically between, for example, if you want to run a virtual router on a DBDK machine versus a dedicated physical hardware? A physical hardware? I'm not positive about that one. I'll show you some performance numbers no, I, here in a bit. We can, we can quite easily make that comparison. So, so yeah. Linux, Linux, Linux DBDK 25X. So that's if you say I'm going to build my standard router in software on a Linux OS, I'm going to use layer 3 forwarding stack to build and build myself a big routing table and use that as an analogy, 25X. So this, yeah. that's pretty substantial. And that's, like I said, the primary reason is you know, poor mode and the, the way we do memory allocation. Yeah. Those are the yeah. top fundamental issues we fix. Now, if you're going to compare it to a, a fixed function router, let's compare 10 gigs. Uh, no, no comparison. We can, do the, we can do this on about a, a core. It takes one core to do what a 10 gig routing ASIC does. But the 10 gig routing ASIC is very cheap today, right? So, okay, you know, a Xeon but it's CPU a whole fixed is box. Be, so, okay. But from a fixed function, if you want to have that comparison, we can say roughly a core for 10 gig. So if you're going to do 40 gig, yeah, we can we can probably do that in about I would say two cores. Yeah, right? roughly about about two cores. Right? So and, it, and it isn't exactly so. It, it, um, 10 gig per core is is a rough is, is it's not like a linear linear scaling. I'm, I'm pretty sure that on the on our latest benchmarks, we a, a substantial router with like a million fl more than million to 10 million flows, we can probably support with two cores, with a little bit of tuning, with things like AVX and that, that AVX instructions, that sort of thing. So, no. one, of the, one of the things you're going to start to see in the world is if somebody does come out with a fixed function box, it may be running Linux on it, but it may be running DPDK. <laughs> <laughs> because they didn't have to do an all the fine tuning tweaking. We did it for them already. And that's what's happening out here today. Okay. So, the, but the, 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 value proposition, the value proposition is not, let's go and replace my fixed function router. What we're actually trying to say is, you know what, we actually have sufficient compute power with DPDK. We can consolidate this in a virtual machine container or running as an application, and you can do an awful lot more with it. If you need to make a modification to that routing app to go and look for some new, tr for some new flow to go, and trigger, to go and trigger some other application to go do something, that's something that this is very, very useful for. Right? But if, you're, if your job is to go and route packets in the core of the network where you need to route 100 gigs today, yeah, DPDK might not be such a good use. But if you're looking at a uh, you know, small business sort of appliance, right, where you have already you know, a firewall, where you already have some sort of an intrusion detection system, or you know, a, a switch of some sort, you know, or uh, you know, some other gateway functionality, this is a, a pretty good base to start from, right? And, and it gets that, you know, gets that cost down because you already need a server system there. So you dedicate a number of cores to your data plane, you dedicate a number of cores to your you know, firewall, you dedicate a number of cores to another function, and we can build a flexible processing pipeline in software way quicker than you can do that in fixed function hardware. Right, and the, and the other advantage is, is you're not necessarily being an embedded programmer anymore. You're still running in a Linux application space you are using some of the technologies we've developed here and other people have developed. Now this is kind of the big framework picture, kind of show this as 
because it took a long time to do this slide, so <laughs> <laughs> got to get our miles out of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. And so you can see we have some hash libraries, quality of service, ACLs. We have rings and timers. Memory is the memory pool and how we do memory buffers is we've fine-tuned that so that allocation is super fast and easy to use. Uh, we have lockless rings, which people find very handy from process to process as well. Of course, all our drivers and everything else. They're all kind of lumped underneath what we call our ETH dev layer. Uh, we have a bunch of crypto stuff now. We've added crypto dev. And we have all, I think this list is probably behind a little bit. I'm not positive, but it might be behind in the number of uh, algorithms we support. We also have what we call a packet framework, which is a pipelining mechanism for it. Right? And then we have meters and so forth, and then a bunch of other uh, extensions. So that's really uh, the big picture, I guess. And it kind of supports all of these pieces down here, the virtual uh, functions. Uh, we support uh, the generic PCI that's in the kernel, and we also have our own IGB UIO. Uh, that's how we steal and manage ports from Linux kernel and back again. And KNI, which is the kernel network interface, allows you to move traffic back and forth between an application and the kernel. Does what that type of performance hit do you take with encryption on top? Uh, it, right now, uh, we have our QAT hardware, our Coletto Creek hardware, or whatever pieces of hardware we have today. There's several different ones. So there's... 8950. 8950. Yeah. So there's... I'll be going into all the, the encryption side of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, the, the key piece here is that uh, the crypto dev framework inside DBDK supports both uh, Quick Assist, which has a whole host of bulk asymmetric, symmetric, asymmetric, and compression capabilities. And this also supports the ASNI um, instructions natively on the core. So you can actually choose from a software or hardware to hit the performance point that you need to target. Um, and it's all hidden in underneath the crypto dev API. Yeah. So again, this is, this is a framework, this, this is really good at packed movement, really good for like an IPsec use case, um, where you've got very high data rate, very high uh, packet transfer rates, and you've got the crypto capabilities native to it. Yeah, he's probably gonna cover some of the performance points of crypto okay. as well. I, I just know that small packets, usually if you do it in software with our ASNI instructions, you can get that done faster. And the larger packets, the 1500, the 1K, those should be done in hardware because it does take time to set up the hardware to do that work. Does that, that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And this is all of our sample apps today. We're going to have a little game later on, you know, that little game where you find the right, no. Uh, <laughs> so, Roll them all over. <laughs> you know, whack them all or whatever. But we've got a lot of examples to show you what you need to use or how to use a particular feature of DPDK. And, uh, you know, you can kind of pick out your favorite one out there. I think the one that typically gets pushed around is the layer three forwarding and uh, the QAT now with the crypto dev and so forth. So you can see we have a CLI support as well, things like that. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, a packet generators that we, that we uh, support. I wrote packetgen that sits on top of DPDK and, and gives you line rate uh, traffic on 10 gigabit ports at 64 byte frames. Okay, um, and on 40, I don't know what the number was, I just got a 40 gig card, it's, it's working really well. Uh, there's T-Rex, which is a different type of traffic generator. Uh, PackageGen is just uh, more of a developer's use to try to get something quick and dirty done, but at least you don't have to have an Ixia sitting next to you all the time. So really handy, uh, MoonGen is another one, and they kind of all hit different areas of testing, so. You just kind of pick and match the ones you like. Uh, but this is kind of the bigger picture to show how we're going to add acceleration. So we've added crypto. We've add, we're going to add some of the programmability here for, for FPGAs and GPUs at some point. Uh, and then compression we're hoping to bring in at some point as well because it's supported in our hardware today. One of the big pieces is, is we brought in all the other SOCs that are out there today. Uh, because most of them were running ARM, I guess. So we brought that piece in and we added support so that they could bring their products into this world. Because most of their stuff in the SOC world, all their memory is controlled by hardware and not software. 
and all their devices are highly integrated parts and things like that. So you guys run into those pieces. So this is how we're going to do it. We have the external memory manager support in there. It seems to work really well. There's a little, little more fine tuning that we've heard, but that's going to happen. And uh, it seems like it's going to work out really, really well for these guys. Now we've done a lot of different applications that sit on top of here. Uh, we have a number of network stacks that sit on top of DBDK. Uh, LibUNS, uh, MTCP, these are all open source, by the way. Um, LibUINet, and then TLDK, Transport Layer Development Kit. And that's a new one we started in the FIDO, or FD.io group, as a project. You can go there as well. There, uh, it's freely available. <coughs> Pull it down, play with it, do whatever you want with it. Right now it's just UDP, but we're going to add TCP at some point. Keith, well, there was a question earlier on on, on how uh, you know FIDO fix, fits into this from Cisco, right? So mm -hmm. can you explain a little bit on what, what they're doing with this? Okay, so in uh, FIDO is, is an umbrella Linux foundation organization, but the primary product that brought that uh, umbrella group together was VPP or vector packet processing. Uh, vector right. parallel packet processing? I can't remember. The packet processing. Yeah, packet processing? Okay. And uh, that one is a whole collection of protocol support that Cisco uses in their routers today. And they open sourced all of that software. So now you can build really robust networking stacks on top of DBDK. And what they did was, is they are using the IO mechanism as to how to drive the traffic to 10 gig. And uh, I mean, they don't normally do it, but they like to have a layer three switch type design. It's not a full OVS type design, open V switch design. But they are able to scale across all the cores at the same pace at line rate. So they've done an excellent job there. Uh, they've taken a lot of uh, clues from, from what we do as well and, and what uh, cache lines and so forth are going on. So VBP is kind of a middleware, if you want to think about it that. DPDK is the IO layer, and then there's the applications that sit on top of that. And VBP is w very well designed. Okay, so I'm going to try to probably cover some of these pieces, and I'm not sure what my time frame is today. Anybody know? <laughs> okay. Another 10 minutes. No, that's not going to be enough time. <laughs> so, really what's going on here in this particular picture is we have what we call the RTM buff, which is a FreeBSD-like term, but it's nothing, the structure doesn't look like a FreeBSD uh, M buff anymore. But it is the same philosophy, meaning that we have uh, an M buff header and the data immediately following it. We don't try to point to the data, we keep the data immediately in place. Uh, that's for performance reasons. Uh, we use huge pages, one gig or two meg huge pages in our Linux systems, uh, so that we can reduce the number of TLB misses in the system. And that's how we map all of this memory into space, into user space. Uh, so that makes it easier for us to see everything at one time and we don't have to take any, any cache misses or, or hits. Now we will take some occasionally. Uh, so with that SROV support, we we're able to have an individual transmit and receive pair per core per port, which means there is no locking for a core to get to any port. It means he can run as fast as he wants and he's doing it constantly. And he doesn't have to worry about locks. And that's the big point. Uh, that really helps a lot. Uh, and there's a bunch of other pieces that fall in here. The memory allocation scheme, we spent a lot of time on how to, to malloc memory and how to consistently make that extraordinarily fast. So there's like caches per core so that you don't even interrupt the primary core uh, pool of, of MBUFFs for your, for your particular CPU because you have a cache of them unless you run out. Hello. Let's skip forward to. Uh, I guess I did. Okay. So the next thing is is, is DPK will run in a VM 
or it'll run in a host space, if you want to call it that, Linux user. <coughs> and then the VM, you can also then map virtual functions or SROV entities directly into the VM, or you can have another mechanism for which is VertIO between the guest and the host, and the host does the actual data movement to the uh, NICs. Uh, let's see. I'm going to try to go past that one a little bit so we can get out of here. Uh, so as I stated, it's almost 98% written in C. And we've spent a lot of time making sure that it's very readable and it's commented instead of just tossing it over the wall. Uh, we have a lot of documentation. Of course, documentation can always be improved. But we have a lot of documentation and examples and so forth to discuss this there as well. There is no fee to join dbdk.org. So hop on, contribute, do whatever you like. Uh, same thing with uh, FIDO, right? There's no fee for that one, I think? In VPV? Yeah. Yeah, you can contribute. So it's really great. Uh, and of course, you could take that code and do whatever you want with it. No so, royalties, no nothing. So the applications that you write to consume DPDK then must be written in C as well? They don't have to be. Can you have an example of one that wasn't? I don't know of one directly. Mm -hmm. No, I, th I think some people have written them in, in Java. <laughs> Uh, some yeah, people have, what that interaction looks like. If uh, it's not, like the uh, so envisioning this being used basically as a dependency, like yeah. as a library. Right. So if, if that's not the case, uh, like for instance, if I wanted to write an application in Go and leverage DPDK, because it's not a running daemon, right? It's not yep. like it's a process you can call. Right. Um, you know what does that look like? I don't know. I'm just curious. Well, like uh, there's some people like uh, T Rex. Um, theirs is Python mm. based. Uh, Moonjin is Lua based. If you've never used Lua before, it's a pretty handy little language called Lua.org. L U A.org. That one is uh, all written that way, and they also use the just in time compiler for Lua to compile it into uh, x86 instructions. And then uh, uh, there's people talking to me about Go. The only downside is the transition from C to Go is a big hurdle. You just have to figure out when to transition from one side to the other. But Go is another one we really are looking at. Uh, Lua obviously is one. Some people have done it to Java. There are some Java bindings in VPP. So, so VPDK then still becomes sort of part of the same compiled binary. Correct. Although you can have shared libraries for gotcha. DBDK. OK, cool. OK. So you don't, you're not, and we also have uh, ABI bindings within DBDK so that you can tell <coughs> what the ABI is or the, at the API. Uh, um, so that you're not trying to bind two different function call types uh, to the same application. It's all over here at dbdk.org. Uh, you can go and do a get clone of it right now if you like. Have at it. Um, I'm gonna try to get to the performance a little bit. As you can tell, back in 2010 with our Westmere platforms with two, um, two socket server, you know, we're getting about 55, which is probably about, I don't know, 10 times that of a Linux kernel performance in a, in a 10 gig. I think this is all 10 gig. Is that correct? Take uh, yeah, they're all, they're all 10 gig. Um, 40, and as you can tell, uh, over time, we've gone up. 40 gig devices. 40 gig? Mm -hmm. oh, OK, 40 gig devices. So you can tell we've gone up in performance on every release significantly in a lot of cases. And the current one I have listed here is the Broadwell um, two socket system. In 2015, we're doing 346 million packets per second in 64 byte frames. <laughs> it's a number that some people don't quite realize what that is. A standard 10 gigabit interface is 14.885 million frames per second. So 40. Just multiply that by four. So you're getting pretty close. And you're basically, we're maxing out the I.O. <coughs> in this particular case, maybe memory. I don't remember which. Yeah, we were, we were actually talking about this in the limo. What, what point are you going to hit the limits of the PCI Express bus for this? We do already in some cases. Yeah, OK. Right? So uh, and this is 64 byte frames. This isn't some big frame. This is 64 bytes and coming in and going out. What does the performance change like when the packet sizes drop? Because I mean, once they start to drop in size, you have a lot more packets to flow. Yeah, 64 on Ethernet is the smallest packet size you can send. Oh yeah, right. 
Yeah, 60, 60 bytes plus a four byte uh, CRC. Um, so, but I mean, as far as the data quantity, you know, you can send an eight byte frame or an eight byte piece of data, it'll just turn into a 64 byte frame yeah. on the wire. So this is the fastest you can go. Uh, so we don't even tell you what the others are because they're all <laughs> maxed out. So, uh, is there any other little questions it's on this? Performance go down if you enable, for example, QoS or something like that on, a, on an interface. So uh, if the hardware is supporting the, the quality of service, then it, it's probably not going to go down unless there is some sort of limitation on the hardware to do that. But as far as DVDK is concerned. Uh, it shouldn't slow down. If you're doing quality of service in software, then yes, it will go down. Because you still have to do that processing someplace. If you're doing it in hardware, then you're good. If you're not, you have to do it in the core and you're gonna take cycles to do it. Uh, but what you can do is, is toss, but what, yeah, but what you can do is toss more cores at the problem and get the same amount of, of how many cores was this using? Uh, 14, 14 cores. There's actually 20, uh, yeah, 14 cores on that particular socket, per socket. So I don't know how many was used for each one. Do you see it there? Uh, I, I don't see it right off hand. But we have uh, 28 physical cores on this system. That's attempting to use all the cores. On the Is that attempting to use all the cores? Yeah, I'm pretty sure we ran out of IO. So, so do you use some kind of NUMA optimization to make sure you're using yep. memory on the right side? All the, all the memory is NUMA aware. All the allocations yep. from BBK is all NUMA aware. So, so we so do it with let's, let's, let's be honest. Partly. So um, what we're trying to do here is showcase best performance, right? And, and this is typically what our, what our customers, our, our uh, you know, direct customers ask to do, right? If we go to any, any one of our top tier telecommunication guys, they'll say, okay, show me your 64 byte performance. And the fundamental reason why you do that is not because you have a complete packet mix in the internet that's 64 bytes, because that's completely untrue, right? You, you mix is anywhere from a small request to a bulk response. That's typically how things work. When you, you know, send a you know, request to some um, you know, uh, Apache web server or whatever, you know, then you know, you're it's a HTTP GET, which is typically a small, small request, and then a bulk response comes back. And, but make no mistake about it, if you have a lot of these requests, you have a lot of these small packets that you need to route through. And therefore, you want to make sure that you have benchmarks for the small packets. And why, why do you look at small packets? Is because it typically exposes the weakness in the platform, right? If you have yeah. a, because there is, uh, you know, with, with a big packet, you're, you're amortized the control the, com the number of control bytes that are involved in the, with a the small packet, right? So, so automatically, big packets, everybody, that's fantastic. But smaller packets, every single silicon manufacturer, whether it is a network processor or a general purpose architecture, struggles with processing 64-byte packets. That's typically what it looks like. And on the PCI Express interface, typically a 64-byte packet manifests itself as a 92-byte uh, interfa you know, interface, well, the number of control that's around it then becomes 92-byte ba packets. So that's typically what we deal with within the platform. But for every, you know, 64-byte packet, when we process the, you know, 92 bytes, well, we need to, you know, make sure that that goes through memory, right, and that or, or goes right into the cache, and we don't write it back to memory, because when we write it back to memory, we incur, you know, a potential, a potential performance hit. So we do a lot of tricks when it comes to allocation, make sure that when you receive a packet or when the time when you receive a packet, you allocate it into cache rather than into, rather than into memory. So when we, process, when we put these sorts of number up, numbers up, it's typically assumed that you're processing all the packets from cache, right? Yeah. So those are some of the you know, intricacies around these benchmarks that, that you see, right? But, but, but it does show you the, the, the limitation. Everybody, you know, all, every silicon manufacturer will put this picture up that says, hey, this is the max 64 byte packets we can transfer. So, and, it's, and, it's, and it is an ideal world. You guys know benchmarks are ideal worlds. But this is a real world from that perspective is that we are able to, from the, from the overhead associated with a packet of the smallest amount of data, you have a huge amount of overhead in that packet to process it. And we're just showing that we can keep that going. And this is an L3 forwarder. Uh, implementation. So we're doing an L3 lookup for these packets as well, 
doing a hash and look up and everything and changing the destination and, and so forth and shipping it out the other side. Come back to your question on QoS, right? There's many ways you can, there's many ways you can deal with it. We, we have hardware QoS in the NIC, right, which allows you to partition certain traffic from each other so you can, you know, dedicate queues to certain traffic and then you, we can, you know, have those queues serviced by certain cores and dedicate more processing power on that core to those queues. So there's many ways you can deal with that. That QoS question is tough to answer because you can look at it from so many, you know, from so many aspects. When we do purely QoS in software where we meter, right, where we take, where we take a fat pipe on a single core and then we're going to go look at, that, look at that traffic and then prioritize the traffic and shove it in a different, in a different uh, you know, pipeline based on the type of traffic that you receive, yeah, you, you, you take a performance hit. But it depends how deep you make those queues. It depends how deep you make the prioritization and where you want to go look in the packet on in terms of uh, figuring out what you want to prioritize on. So that's kind of a, a difficult question to answer. So. And also, in, in DPDK, we're processing n number of packets at a time. That's how we amortize that cost of the overhead across all the data. And as you can tell, I mean, at a 40 gig, 16.8 nanoseconds is a packet arrival rate. <coughs> Most people, my wife would never understand what that means, but you guys obviously will understand what that means. It's a lot. 33 cycles? It's like, can't do anything with that. But because we're amortizing that cost over multiple packets, we can push that data through the system. And we've done everything else to me. And they're telling me I, I'm number one, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> hopefully you guys... Uh, I, I think we've kind of discussed this. I, I probably can't tell you much more about it. Uh, I, I want to make sure you do understand we are using the huge pages that are built into these systems to make sure that we don't get to TLB misses and things like that. We optimize for cache, uh, making sure cached, we don't stall the CPUs. Uh, if you look at any application today, I don't know what the number is, but it's a fairly high percentage that the CPU will be stalled on memory or stalled on instructions or stalled on something. Uh, but in DBDK, there's almost very, there's very little stall of those processors because we are dealing with them in such an optimized fashion. And this is some more pieces you guys can go read. It'll be online. Uh, I'm not going to go through it. And as you talked about, we talk about NUMA, we talk about all these other pieces, uh, and we try to do make sure the hardware prefetches and everything are all done. And here's some more pieces you can go read about. Uh, there's, there's tons of stuff to read uh, and optimizations for this. But for a $3,000 machine with, with a two or one 10 gigabit NIC card with two ports on it, you can get a pretty good uh, network traffic generator if you want it uh, for a very low cost. Okay. Uh, and of course, we, this is the summary. So we're all BSD software licensed. We're all, uh, you know, DBK is a very, very active community, as Jim stated. So we're really trying to push that forward and making sure everybody's in there. It isn't just Intel. Uh, you can go look at our statistics that Tim uh, O'Driscoll will push out here in the next couple of days about contributions to this organization. Uh, it's, it's, yes, it's a lot of Intel folks, but it's also a lot of other people that contribute to this group. And there's all those places you can go and poke at and get your websites from.